prime. All I'm TV. saying is buckle your seatbelts. Buckle my yeah. seatbelts. Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Hello and welcome to the Ritual Misery Podcast, episode 126 for Thursday, May the 4th. Be with you. 2017. This is a show where lifelong friends and their guests celebrate all things geek. And man, have we got another amazing returning guest with us tonight. Kent, why don't you do the introduction for the man who... Well, I'm just going to cut in the introduction for you. The man who started (laughs) writing to impress a lady. (laughs) He certainly did. We have Steve Perry with us, not the rock singer. We have best-selling author Steve Perry, uh, the... The thing that brought him to my attention was reading this book uh, quite a a few years ago now. Uh, Shadows of the Empire was a fantastic Star Wars book. And um, I'm so privileged to get to know Steve a little bit. Uh, Episode 50 was our introduction to Steve. And we are incredibly honored to have him here tonight. Steve, may the fourth be with you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, Kent, when are you going to make it to Oregon to get that sign, dude? Uh, one of these days. Like, I, it's it's definitely my goal. Like, Steve promised me that we would have a beer together, and um, yeah, it's up to me to make my way up. But there. you you, you got to get back in shape for that, though. I mean, he's going to kick your ass. <laughs> that, that's probably true. <laughs> um, so, have you ever been to Oregon? Like, has has is that a place you've ever been, Kent? No, uh, closest I've been, I think, is the SeaTac. <laughs> In Washington, uh, that's that's not that's not close. <laughs> yeah, no, not really. <laughs> um, I mean, because you got Steve there, you got to uh, uh, Klamath Falls, which is the only McDonald's within 100 miles of Klamath Falls, and you've got the entire set of Goonies, like all in one place, man. Like you got to make it to Oregon sometime. Yep, one of these days. I I can't wait. Yeah, see, I've seen one of those three things. Hey, um, how was your weekend, Kent? Um. My weekend was okay, fairly uneventful. Uh, Monday, I had jury duty, though. <laughs> um, so was, this, was, was this like bona fide jury duty, or were you just sitting there like waiting, hoping not to get selected kind of jury duty? Uh, yeah, it was kind of that. So <laughs> my group got called in, and uh, because they, they assign you a group number, and then you're kind of on the hook. You're like, you're on call for, it's supposed to be three months, but my group got lucky, and we're only on the hook for two months. Uh, so I get called in on Monday. And they go through the whole jury selection process. And the, the, the interesting thing to me was some of the excuses that people give the judge. I had a guy sitting right next to me that uh, because the judge asked like basic questions like, OK, here's a list of people that are involved in the case. Do you know anyone on here, basically? And they kind of go one at a time. And everybody's like, yeah, I know him. He's my neighbor. I don't think I can be fair because, you know, I, I changed his diapers when he was a kid, you know, whatever. The guy next <laughs> to me was like. He was like, um, uh, Your Honor, uh, I'm an anarchist. I don't believe in laws, and I don't think that I can, uh, you know, judge someone for not obeying a law. So, uh, <laughs> wow, it was it was pretty funny. Steve, have you ever had jury duty? Oh yeah, I've been on several juries. I always get picked. Uh, I get the notices. My wife and I lived in the house we were in now for uh, 35 years. She's never gotten a summons to jury duty. I've probably gotten 12. And most of the time, because I'm a writer, I can say, well, I can't. I'm, I'm on a book deadline, so I can't go. And they say, they say, okay, fine, you're excused. Now what they say is, oh, you're on the book deadline. When will the book be done? And I, tell them, I say, okay, fine, we'll put you into the pool after that. So, yeah, I've been on several juries, so some of which were hilarious. So and One of the guys we judged last time, actually, was an anarchist, a guy who didn't believe in laws and who had his own license plate that he made up, put on his car and <laughs> driving drunkenly down the road and got stopped by the police because they didn't recognize his license plate. Cause it was like from the world. Um, it was really fun. <laughs> you know, you, you should just start writing a book that has to do with jury rigging yeah. and then just, yeah, just not, not have a rigging. deadline on it. Just let it continue out. So every time they ask you to be on a jury, you'd be like, I'm actually writing a book about jury rigging. Like, I'm probably not the best person to have on a jury. It's it's a uh, it's the citizen's duty. You have to go and call. Yeah, that, that uh, <laughs> uh, that'll be interesting for the TED talk later. Um, 
Hey, uh, I went as as the viewers on the show know. I went to Fairbanks this weekend, watched my daughters play some soccer, um, and uh, Kent, have you ever heard of hypermyeline? I oh. had, I hadn't until just the other day. I looked it up, and um, it, it sounds infuriating to anyone that <laughs> witnesses this. Um, did did you take this up? Um, so I actually two vehicles ago I owned a Camry hybrid, and yeah. when I was looking in the in the the hybrid forms and this and that and how to you know get the best gas mileage, I came across the term hypermyeline a lot. And what it is for those of the, those of you that don't know, it is. Um, trying to extend your gas mileage to the absolute maximum using whatever legal means is available to, especially when it comes to your driving habits. So it includes everything from choosing the proper gasoline to maximize your mileage, um, per dollar and slowly getting on the accelerator, coming onto the highway, slowing down well ahead of time in order to slow, you know, in order to not waste gas while you're exiting the highway, um, I can't imagine doing it in like San Francisco. Like, I don't think it could possibly exist there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no such thing. Um, there. And while I didn't do that, <laughs> hot beverages in the chat room says extreme tailgating. That's one yeah. of the techniques. It is. Um, yeah. While I didn't do that, especially considering I was the lead vehicle between my wife and I, her, our vehicles, I was in, in the lead. Um, I, I did lock in my cruise control. I did avoid sudden stops and everything else. I wanted to see on the way up there and back, I drive a Dodge 2500 power wagon. Like it is not a small vehicle. It's a three quarter ton truck. It weighs empty. It weighs about 6,800 pounds. And of course we had all of our bags and everything else in it. Plus a couple kids in the back seat, everything else. I wanted to see what mileage I could squeeze out of my truck on the drive through the mountains to Fairbanks and back. And for the weekend, including the around town travel that we did once we got to Fairbanks, I got 16.5 miles per gallon. <laughs> uh, As opposed to what good? you normally get, which is? Okay, so a little backstory. My <laughs> wife, when, when, when we first bought the truck, I was actually in Korea, came back from, off vacation. We realized we we're going to Alaska. Our old truck wasn't going to pull the trailer, our 35-foot travel trailer through Canada. So we wanted to get, we wanted to upgrade the truck a little bit. We ended up getting the power wagon because it, it was the only 2500 Dodge that we could find with six seats. All the others had the little console thing in the front, five people. We had six. It didn't work. So... We got the power wagon, and then I went back to Korea. My wife drove it as her daily driver back and forth to work while my sister-in-law drove the van. My wife averaged about seven miles per gallon because she may only be five feet tall, but she's got all of her weight is in her foot. foot. So <laughs> she would, you know, and the, the speed limit on base is 30 miles an hour, and she'd get there in about half a second. You know, because uh, when you're driving a 2004 Toyota Sienna and then you get in a a, a, a 6.4 liter truck, like the, that that acceleration, it's it's addictive. I mean, it's fun. So she was getting about seven miles per gallon, six miles per gallon, something like that. Now my daily driving, when I'm going ten over the limit, like I normally do to keep up with traffic around here, I get about thirteen. And the last month or so, I've cut down. I'm, I go exactly the speed limit the entire time. I, I, I pick my lane and everything else. And I'm getting about 15, just just driving the normal speed limit. And that's not hypermiling. That's just getting into the traffic and just staying at the speed limit. All right. So 16 and a half to Fairbanks and back is a 700-mile round trip. Um, and, oh, by the way, it's fucking gorgeous. Oh, my gosh. Like Denali, the peak of Denali peeking through the mountains, like so far out, you can't even barely see it. It's 20,000 feet high. It's amazing. So I recommend the drive. That that mileage is terrible, dude. Yeah, it is. <laughs> like, in my, my Mustang, I get 22. Uh, the 22 Rough, is what uh, my wife got in her Jeep Grand Cherokee. Yeah. And I mean, I'm getting on it in the Mustang. Yeah. Uh, I, I do pretty much the exact opposite of hypermileage. <laughs> now, the one thing I will do when I get out on the highway, I will put the uh cruise control on and i, I won't touch the accelerator mm. but coming off of a of a, a stoplight or something like right. that like i get to 60 miles per hour as quickly as i can mm -hmm. and yeah and yeah man the, 
the the problem I, I the problem is it, it took us uh, nine days or whatever eight days to get here from Texas, pulling a thirty five foot trailer at seventeen almost eighteen thousand pounds. I'm guessing it would have taken you about five or six months to get there with all that <laughs> in the Mustang. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, well, okay. You, you might yeah. beat me off the line, but I'm going further in the woods. <laughs> Steve, have you done anything interesting this week? Oh, yeah. I do something interesting every week. I'm never bored. Uh, Sunday, I went to a, a jam. We have a musical jam here a couple of times a month where a bunch of acoustic people get together at a local pub and, uh, and play for a couple, three hours. And so I went to a jam and play with a bunch of people that I mostly know. Um, I play ukulele, uh, tenor ukulele, which is a little bit bigger than the average size. And I sing a lot of blues and rock, which is kind of funny when you have that instrument. Because uh, when you think blues, the first thought that comes to your mind is ukulele. Um, <laughs> but we had a singer come in, a woman named uh, Angel Boucher, the local singer in, in Portland. She blew the roof off the place. She came in there and it was amazing to listen to. So yeah, I had a, I had a good a good session. Um, other than that, mostly what I've been doing this week is enjoying the two days of sunshine and then yard work, which goes with. In, in Oregon, if you have a day of sunshine, the first thought that comes to your mind is yard work because you we had 174 days of rain in, in 250 day period or something like that. It 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 does drizzle here some. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I. I just I, I wish I had more time and um that's right the talent to really play in a band and and, and pick up a jam and actually play. <laughs> yeah, man. I, Ken, Ken's got I bass got the, guitars behind him right now and he doesn't yeah, have the time like somewhere I don't know how to point yeah. it further, further right there right the stop no there we don't go. look too far. There, right there we go. Finger the bases. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah, it's been quite a while since I've picked those up. Uh, I actually I picked the bass up probably like six months ago for about half an hour uh mm. and uh yeah that's that's the closest i've been to being musical anytime in recent memory uh but yeah i'm with you amos i wish i had the the time and the actual talent to to really do it sort of thing. yeah i uh, i just talked to our friend jeremy um last weekend or weekend before maybe and he's still playing playing in bands and things like oh. that man that, that dude still gigging even yeah speaking of jeremy uh appropriate for may the 4th he got a tattoo today what of boba fett what yeah i'm not sure i'm not sure where he got it uh i think it i think it might have been on his arm i'm not sure uh but yeah that's he sent me a clipped up picture i'm not sure where it's at (laughs) yeah um so the other are you a tattoo guy steve what? Are you a tattoo tats guy? Do you have Do you have tats? No, no, I'm inkless. I have a son-in-law who is a tattoo artist, and he's offered. But uh, I haven't really haven't seen that many things that I've wanted to keep with me for the rest of my life. Uh, I thought about getting a ring tattooed on my finger, a wedding ring, and I thought, well, no, I have a ring. Uh, <laughs> and and it, 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 some point, somewhere along the way, somebody gave me some advice. They said, you know, if you, if you want to put a tattoo on your hand or your arm or your leg, whatever, Draw a little picture in the back of your hand of something and and just leave it there for a year. Keep keep inking it. And then when you get to the point where you're you're in, if you're OK with it, then go for it. Mm-hmm. And I haven't seen anything that I wanted you know, painted. I mean, I, I love seeing people with good ink. And yeah. I know some people have some gorgeous ink on them. And, and uh, you can see really artistic stuff. But, uh, it's, it's, you know, I come from a different age. You know, when I was a kid, tattoos were things that sailors wore. You know, they had them on their forearms. They Popeye, you know. Yeah, I I have eleven tattoos. Uh, most of them are great ideas done with mediocre ability. So, <laughs> Kent uh, Kent has gone the opposite way. He has no no tattoos, but they're all done exceptionally well. well right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm kind of I'm, I'm right there with Steve. Uh, I'm not opposed to ink whatsoever. It's just like, I haven't found that thing that I just have to have on me forever. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I don't know. I, I mean, I'm not going to get a tattoo on my, on my, you know, open my noggin, but I, I, it's just a form of self-expression. Some people wear diamond, uh, diamond earrings and yeah. shit like that, and yeah. I just I wear ink. My, so 
my daughter, yeah. because my son-in-law is a tattoo artist, has tattoos all over her, mm. and and she just is really it's just like it's no big deal. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want anybody to see it all covered up. As long as yeah. you put them on your face, you know, you can cover up anything. That, that's kind of my thing, man. Once you get tattoos on your face, you're kind of resigned to never working a real job again, right? That's right. Like, yeah, and, and tattoo faces. That's, yeah, like you face. have to be an artist. From that <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never seen anyone with ink on their face that was like a working Joe. Like, hey, man, I'm out here just trying to trying to get my money for my family, blah, 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 blah. And I'm not saying that if you have ink on your face that you're automatically a deadbeat or whatever else. I just haven't seen that. I've never experienced – every time I've seen someone with ink on their face – they are not in a good place in life. Yeah. And I, I, I don't know if correlation is causation on that one. I'm just, there's a no, definite I've correlation seen, I, in I my seen, experience. I've seen two different types. The, what you just described and artists. Like I've, I've seen people that are, you know, professional musicians or painters or things like that, that are just kind of, you know, kind of the, the hippie uh, bohemian lifestyle kind of thing. Um, or like you said, uh, somebody that's just not going. Well, I think you have this 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 reverse bell, okay, where face tattoos are acceptable. You're either um, in, in the poor area, or you're so rich no one gives a shit anymore. But <laughs> but the further you go from there, it kind of dips. The acceptability dips down into this reverse bell until it hits zero, where you're you know at like middle class working stiff, right? Like that's no middle class working stiff it has has ink all over his face. But then as soon right. as you start going from there, it becomes more and more acceptable as you go out. So yeah, right. Mike Tyson. Yeah, you can you can put a tattoo on your face if you're Mike Tyson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, it wouldn't accept for acceptable for him until he started losing money and going to jail. <laughs> <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah. Further yeah. correlation. Hey, um, something else I've been doing this week, man. Uh I've been really getting into the DLC and playing. I, I've been watching YouTube videos and doing research. I have never been into a game. Uh, well, I haven't been into a game in years as deep as I am into The Division. And I know it's a dying game. It's, a, it's one year in. There's other games. It's already got a sequel planned and, and, and you know everything else. Like People have moved on from this game, but I will not let it go. And it is just so much fun. Now that I'm at the end game where I, can, I'm, I actually feel capable of you know gathering gear and... and playing my ass off with it it is just amazing fun man it's so awesome and it's free this weekend it's free to play this weekend if you if you want to try it out the only thing that i've even seen of this game because i I had to google it when you when you threw it in the notes i'm like what the hell is the division i looked it up and the first thing that came up for me was the honest trailer the honest game trailer yep for it i had screen junk i hadn't seen that until you played it or until you sent it to me and yeah, it, uh, it's not wrong. Like it, it's not. It's... <laughs> it, it, it looks like a pretty interesting game, actually. Um, but uh, between the uh, between the division and um, playing Paper IO on my phone, that's that's pretty much been sucking in all of my free time here lately. Yeah, I I can't remember the last time I've been in a, into a game other than like the you know time wasters on on the phone. Yeah. Uh, you know, it used to be Angry Birds. Now it's uh, that. That racing game that you got me into, what is it called? Hill Hill Climber, or hill, something climb, like that? hill Climb Racing Two, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like that. I'm, that's my jam right now. Uh, I didn't realize you were the, playing that until you you skipped way past me in both <laughs> in both ability and uh, progression through the game. And I was just like, oh, all well, this. Sh- I'm not playing that no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pretty much these days. About the only time that I that I sit down in front of a, a console game or anything like that is is when my kids ask me to play something. Uh, we actually had a we had a Mortal Kombat tournament this weekend. Hmm. Uh, you know, we'll we'll do stuff like that. Or or Isaac's really into the NBA game, and uh, I'll I'll play him every now and then. But other than that, like it, it's been a really really long time since I've I've been in like immersed in a game. Steve, what's uh, uh, are, what's, what's, do, what's are your you time immersed? waster? No, I'm I'm an analog guy. I, you know, I I never got to be a gamer. My kids played. My grandkids played. And I looked at it and thought, well, you know, I could be playing this game and, and running through the scenario, or I could be writing scenario and making money for it. So that's kind of the way I went. Damn that's, it. I, I hate I, it when people, have, right better <laughs> yeah. hate it when people pretty... have better answers. Yeah. I hate it when people have better answers. Something I didn't mention earlier, this is kind of my geeky thing of the week. On that trip up there to Fairbanks and back, we used walkie-talkies. Oh. Like straight-up nice. walkie-talkies. 
And I got I got to tell you, man, that was fun. Like just the action of having a walkie-talkie in the in the in the car and calling the car behind us on the on the on the radio. It was it was it, stupid, it was dumb, and it was geeky, and I enjoyed the hell out of it. This reminds me of something that we did right about twenty years ago. We were both. This is when we were kind of new to the military. We were both at our first like permanent duty assignments. You were in South Carolina, and I was in Florida. We were both back home in Indiana at the same time, and we left. We you know we both drove our separate vehicles. Mm-hmm. We left at the same time, and. We, uh, what, probably about three hours, three or four hours of the trip, we were together yeah. before we like, until off. Until Memphis or something like that, I think. Uh, or maybe Louisville. Yeah, maybe. I don't Louisville. know. But, uh, yeah, it was either Kentucky or Tennessee. We, we branched off. And um, we were on CBs. Yeah. 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 We had trucks and we had big ass antennas on top of them. And, and we were on CBs, and well, that was a blast. Well, well, we had big antennas on top of your S10 and my Ford um, uh, uh, shoots. It starts with a C or something. I don't know. It's like the the miniature uh, uh, Taurus is what it was. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, man. But yeah, that was that was a blast. I still uh, have that CB, by the way. Uh, I, I, mine is. I actually stumbled across mine a couple weeks ago. I was going through the garage, like you know, the boxo crap that you haven't seen in in fifteen years. I was digging through that, and I actually found my CD <laughs> or C, CB. CB. Jeez, citizen, citizen stand. Is that what it is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> were, you, were you ever a CB user? Oh yeah, my father was a ham radio operator. I, he, I think... he was a radio man on a destroyer in the World War Two. So he had a uh, ham set up at his at wherever we lived until he you know got real too old to use it. So yeah, we played with all that stuff. We used to do things where we would get together with a bunch of guys that were that had ham radios, and they would send a rabbit out to hide, and then they would, everybody would go look for him, and we figure out where he was when he broadcast by triangulating, and figuring out you know and then whoever got their first one the prize. And, but yeah, I, I kind of grew up with all that stuff, and yeah, I, I've had handheld radios and CBs and. Yeah, my, my wife and I had an RV for a while. We would go out camping, and if I was out walking the dogs, I'd take a, a handheld radio with me. Actually, at one point, I even had a, a wrist radio, you know, so that I could I could call and, and tell her that you know where we were. Dick oh, Tracy geez. style. Yeah, exactly. And it 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 boys toys, and we all know that it's boys toys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Oh man, so when I was looking on YouTube. And uh, found that that uh, the division video, Amos. I came across some Star Wars stuff, mm. and in keeping with the theme, I came across some videos that some musicians made. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> they happen to also be Beatles fans. Yes, and I, they, I, yeah, this is amazing. They made Star Wars versions of the entire album of uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Yeah, I know. And they, and they is, sound is that what this is? <laughs> oh, it's amazing. And my favorite <laughs> one was uh, this one that, that Amos is bringing up now. It's to the tune of Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Yes. Luke is in the desert and whining. Yes. <laughs> had me rolling for about two minutes. I absolutely missed it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to play the sound, but uh, of course my audio settings are not set up ready. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Oh, this is ridiculous. Old operators and protocol droids. Fix them like you're on <laughs> Oh, that is awesome. Very clever. Very cleverly done. They said, they said it took them like five years to get the whole thing done. Yeah. And yeah. I can see why. They put a lot of energy into it. That's great. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. They're they're all pretty good. I didn't listen to the entire album, but I sample. I at least sampled every song on it. Yeah. And they they're all pretty good. Yeah. I'm going to throw that in the uh, in the chat room right there, so people can tune into something more interesting than this show. Uh, hey. <laughs> Rick, your attention away from our show. <laughs> Look, half, half the chat room's like, ah, oh, yeah, let's go watch that. Um, one one last thing, and I'm just going to say this real quick. Did you know that Windows 10 does not have a safe mode? 
Really? Yeah. No, no. It, I mean, I, it does. But you actually have to turn the computer off by the power switch, not the power button, the power switch, three times to get Windows to bring up the menu. So when I installed the driver this uh, last night, it didn't take because it was an 8.1 driver. And instead of coming up with like dirt, it just sat there a little spinning wheel. And I actually had to go through and search online how to get to the safe, to the safe mode. Wow. Yeah. Now, I did hear that Windows is co- Windows 10 has a new version coming out specifically for notebooks. I think yeah. it's called Windows 10 S. Yeah. Yeah. It's- Whatever. Yeah, it's like a, like an <laughs> ultra slim down, like trying to emulate iOS is what I kind of gather from it. it it's actually it more the, more of a competitor with Chrome OS. Or your apps from the Windows Store and things yeah. like that. It's it's a it's a stripped down controlled version. Um, you know what's what's not controlled? Um, the weather? No, no the the weather the weather is just it's just there, man. It's uh, I mean it, it controls itself. <laughs> uh, what? Tell me, Amos. What is not controlled? What's not controlled are seventeen of the most amazing people on the planet giving us uh, a little bit of scratch each week. On Patreon. Yes, and we absolutely appreciate each and every one of them. Some some are giving a little bit. Some are giving um, quite a bit more than I would expect people to give us for this show. Um, and but we, it doesn't matter how much you give. We absolutely appreciate everything. Uh, we try our best to give our patrons what we can. We give you guys the pre shows and post shows of these episodes. Uh, we we give you um, things from the vault that aren't available to the general public. Like what? Uh, well, one one thing that we got, the newest thing that we put on there that's extra special is we had Gloria Young on the show on a special weekend edition of the show that was not available to the public. Uh, Gloria Young being the mother of Justin Robert Young, one of the prominent members of the Diamond Club. And uh, we talked to her for about an hour, and it was an amazing interview, and it is available to our patrons right now. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and if you're talking about things that just aren't going to be available outside the patron community... Uh, how about our alpha episodes? That's right. Way you, early. You want to hear yeah, two guys it, just it, ramble on with absolutely nothing to say? Man, we got three <laughs> of them for you in the can, ready to go. It's it's a lot like this show without chat realm <laughs> <laughs> and without guests. We don't have any awesome guests. We yeah, just talk no, for it's, s- it's it's pretty interesting stuff to go back into the vault and uh, just just kind of see where we started. Yeah, um, yeah, check it out. It's patreon.com slash ritual misery. Um, hey, real quick, um, there's a little thing we'd like to do on the show to kind of get to know our guest a little bit and before we just jump right in and start talking all about them. Um, and it starts out with a little, uh, a little kicker like this. You've got 60 seconds. Get your mind right. It's time for Hot Takes on the Ritual Misery Podcast. All right, Steve, we like to put our guests through this little game. It's called Hot Takes, like you heard. And uh, I'm going to throw some things at you, and you just you can rant and rave or do whatever. Tell us how you feel about it. Uh, as soon as you hear this sound, we're going to move on to the next topic. Are you ready? Got it. All right. Jar Jar Binks, am I right? No, you're wrong. <laughs> wrong, 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 wrong. An abortion. An a, a, a evil. A, 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 a Donald Trump thing. I mean, it's just... no. <laughs> No, it's just the not ukulele, right. am I right? I don't know what he was thinking. It's like midi chlorins. I just, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> the ukulele, am I right? Oh, yeah, ukulele, sure. It's a wonderful instrument. Much better than you think it is. You want to go see somebody good? Go see Jake Shimabukuru on YouTube. Make you real interested. Michael Reeves, am I right? I haven't heard from Michael in a while. He's uh, still alive, last I heard. Uh, I got a note from somebody the other day wanting to contact him for uh, some work, and I, I emailed it to him, but uh, I don't know if he took it or not. Dash Rindar, am I right? Oh, Dash. Oh, Dash. Dash is my replacement. You know, we, we couldn't use a certain character in Star Wars because he was, and I won't tell you who he was, but he was frozen in a block of carbonite. Uh, so, Dash. <laughs> And last but not least, the Ritual Misery podcast. Am I right? Oh, hey, it's fun. I had a great time last time I was here, and it's even better than it was before. I mean, what can you do? Awesome. 
<laughs> awesome. Thanks for playing along, Steve. That was fun. Sure. Uh, for people that don't know, uh, Michael Reeves is another author, uh, someone that Steve has collaborated with several times in the past. And uh, I know that I knew that you guys were friends, and I I didn't know what he was up to, so I just I threw his name in there to see what you had to say about him. Um, and then Dash Rendar, for those that are uninformed, is one of the main characters in this book. I did want to ask you: did you did you come up with Dash yourself, or did the Lucasfilm like creative team kind of give that character? to you? No, Dash was mine. Uh, we, uh, we had a big meeting at the ranch uh, when we sat down to do this. It was a, a really interesting project because it was, uh, it was essentially a dress rehearsal for the new movies and all the products that were going to be connected to it. And we started talking about the, the basic idea was the, the darker side of the, of the, the empire, the, the, the criminal side. And they had come up with a main character that they liked, Shizor. Shizor was Lucy Wilson's creation. And it, the name comes from, I think, it, the pronunciation came from Portuguese because it's X-I-Z-O-R and you look at that and have no idea how to pronounce it but it's pronounced Shizor. Um, I made, made a point of pointing that out in the book so that people could understand it and I still get people asking. But so when when they came up with this general idea of the underground and I said okay so who, can we, who do we have, who can we use and pretty much it was I could use anybody that was available. I could use Vader, I could use Luke and Leia. So this is great. You, but I, I can't use Han because at the time that these, the, the book was set, Han's frozen in a block of carbonite. So I said, well, we need Han because Han is basically the, the most fun character. The smartest character is C-3PO, but Han is the, the most fun character. So they said, well, what do you got? I said, how about we have a young smuggler kind of guy who, you know, is a little edgier, kind of like Han's younger brother. So that's how we came up with, with Dash Rindar. And the names were just based sort of on the the general way Star Trek names were based, Dash, you know, it, he's dashing and, you know, and he's well drawn. So, <laughs> um, yeah, that's that's sort of where he came from. Cool. Um, so when Lucasfilm was bought out by Disney, uh, they basically shit canned the whole the whole extended or expanded universe. And yeah, uh, it's the name now. <laughs> so, but something that they've been doing a lot lately, especially with their animated properties and the novels, they've been bringing back certain characters, certain elements and settings and things like that that existed before. Uh, most notably, Grand Admiral Thrawn. Sure. It's, it has been brought back into the fold through um, Star Wars Rebels. Uh, yeah. The previous animated series, uh, The Clone Wars, they had a... Uh, well, they had a series of episodes that dealt in the underworld, and they had a council of Falleen. Yes. And uh, did so? Did Lucy Wilson come up with the Falleen, or was that a was that a uh, pretty much what I had? What I had for for Shizor was that he was tall and green. Um, there was a little concept art uh, that, that uh, one of their staff artists had done. And so I, I had an idea of, of what he looked like, but there was nothing else about him. Uh, he was just some sort of evil overlord. So I came up with the planet, and I came up with the, a background and history and the name. The Falleen is, is a made-up name. Uh, it's actually from Fellini, <laughs> the movie maker. Um, <clears throat> and, and so I got to do all the backstory, and all the, pretty much the backstory on everybody who wasn't canon, who wasn't you know, already uh, laid out. And then I got to do some interesting stuff between the different characters where I, I explained, well, how did, did uh, you know, that Bosch costume come to be and, and where did the thermal detonator come from? All these questions that I had had when I watched the movies, I got to answer. What does Darth Vader think about when he's in that hyperbaric chamber? Well, it's a good question, isn't it? I get to answer it. So and it, the, the fun part of it was is they pretty much left it to me. We went back and forth. We sat in a big room with all of the the Star Wars people that were going to be involved with this project, so, except for the comic book people who were, who were on, on, on the phone conversation. Um, and the game players and the artists and the, and the guys who were going to be creating the, the video game, uh, the computer game, and, and, and the toy makers and all this, we all were just sort of kicking back ideas about how, and I was taking notes, about how this whole story was going to go. Um, and I was pretty much asking questions, well, you know, Somebody would say, well, we need a motorcycle chase because that, that'll work really well in the game. Fine, so I'll write down motorcycle chase. 
and and then we need this, we need that. And, and pretty much what I tried to do was to get something from everybody as to what they would need in in their aspect of the project and put it somewhere in the book. Um, the comic book people wanted to have, uh, you know, certain certain characters and everybody wanted there, there was a piece of pie that they wanted and so we sort of parsed them out um so that everybody got some some piece of the action and then i went home and wrote a a fairly extensive uh outline of the of the novel uh which became the basis for all the other products uh everything else that was tied into that was based on that outline once it was signed off on um and then i just wrote the book from there what didn't make the book. I mean, what, what was what? your you know when you when you're making your trimmings and you're cutting down the story and you're saying okay that didn't quite fit. What was the the arc or the little story or the chapter that that you wished could have made the book that just didn't didn't quite fit? There there were two things that happened. One is the funny story, which is I I wanted to have a scene of the droids fighting uh, flying the ship, the, the Millennium Falcon. And I said, I want to have a scene where 3PO and R2 fly the ship. And they said, no, you can't do that. I said, why? He said, well, because they're not viewpoint characters. And, you know, I had viewpoint. I said, well, I can see, I can finesse it. I can write it so that, so that we know what's going on without them being viewpoint characters. Why don't I believe it? Well, no, really, I can't. Well, sorry. And I said, look, let me do this. Let me write the sequence. And if you don't like it, I'll write it in such a way that it's, that it's a set piece. You can just pick the whole thing up and move it out. And I'll replace it with whatever you want to put in. They said, okay, fine. But, but we don't, we're not going to like it. And so I wrote the scene. I sent it off. And I waited. And the phone rang. And, and my editor was on the phone. And he said, yeah, I just talked to the people at Lucas. But yeah, can you make that sequence a little longer? Yes. <laughs> uh, and they liked it. And, and the way I did it was I had them on the radio talking to Han and, 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 and uh, Luke. And so you, you were hearing what they were doing. You weren't seeing it. So, uh, and the other was I wanted to have a scene where – I basically had them stop at a gas station and use the phone um, in the Millennium Falcon. And they pull over and they're waiting and there's an alien on the phone. And he's talking to his girlfriend and he won't get off. And they're waiting and they're waiting and he won't get off the phone. I thought it was hilarious. They said, no, no, you can't do that. <laughs> the, only other, the only other real real disagreement we had was whether or not Luke could talk to 3PO and, and R2. Well, 3PO, obviously, because he speaks all these languages. But R2 was always speaking, I think it's Mechanese. Um, mm. It's droid language, and and so three people goes blah, 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 and Luke goes no I don't think so I think we're gonna go over here instead and they had these conversations all through the movie, and so I had a sequence where they were talking and someone explained to me you can't do that because they can only talk to each other when they're both hooked into the X wing and or some computer and they're talking via the, the crap. I said look I look and I went through the the movies with a stopwatch and I picked all the places where Luke said. No, no, I don't think so. I think we should do this instead. And R2 goes, Boop. He says, no, no, wait. Obviously, he understood what he was saying. Uh, and they explained to me that someone in one of the books had done it that way. And so we were sort of limited there. And I said, but you can see. So just think of them like Timmy and Lassie uh, of the yeah. old TV series. You know, Lassie's really smart. And, you know, Timmy sort of gets an idea of what she was. it, Timmy? Somebody fell in the well? Said, okay, fine. It's, it's your franchise. You do what you want. But you're wrong. So. <laughs> Yeah, that was pretty much my 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 only contention with them. That and they're still wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah, because I, I don't know if you've watched the the current television series Rebels. Yeah, but the um uh the the R two replacement I can't think of his name right now. Yeah. Uh, but they talk to him all the time. It's like yeah. half the characters can understand every. Yeah. All the beeps and squeaks well, and everything. Can't, can't, it just means that we found the real reason that they, they, they took all the stuff out of canon and made it Legends. They had to correct the mistake <laughs> where yep. people can actually talk to droids. Like They, they were like, oh, damn it. They oh, were right. They had it right all along. They were right. Ah. I, I think they stuck it all as a legend so that they wouldn't be constricted by it. But if there was anything that they wanted to use that they thought would draw viewers or, or readers in, they would use it. I mean, I, t I was sitting on the panel with, with Tim Zahn. Uh, we were doing a signing someplace, and I, I was asking him about the thing. He said, yeah, yeah, I could be a legend, or I could be part of the canon. You know, and I had pieces in, in – there were pieces in that book that were considered canon because they showed up in the remake of the movie. You know, there's, a, there's a scene where a ship flies off of, of – and it's Darth it, – it's Dash's ship. Yep, um, yeah, that's right. And, you know, there's, there's a couple, three pieces in there where they, they took stuff that was in the book and they put it in the movie – 
And so, yeah, oh, I'm canon. Well, not anymore, dude. Uh, that's not how it works. It's all gone. Disney owns it now. The mouse rules. And I think it's great. I think it's, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I'm still getting money from that book. It came out in 1996. I still get a little royalty from it every so often. Not a big royalty, but a little bit of a royalty. And it earned out, and it made me money. It made me happy. It made me the New York Times best-selling author, Steve Perry. I got no complaints at all with the way that process went. Yeah, we, that the last time we talked was right was, was September ish, uh, before the the Force Awakens com, came out. Yeah, it was twenty fifteen. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, yeah. Since from that point to now, it's been almost two years. From that point to yeah, about now, a year, about a year. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> According to my math, it's like twenty months, which is pretty close to two years. Um, the how? I mean, have you kept up with it? I'm, I'm assuming you've seen the movie, like uh, you know, The oh, Force yeah. Awakens and and Rogue Rogue One or whatever. But oh yeah. Um, how? What is your perception of how the storyline has continued? Well, of course, the, the first movie was essentially Episode Four redone. I mean. Uh, the, it, you know, it was a new hope kind of revised. I frankly, I thought they did a good job. I, I thought the, the, the most recent entry was, I mean, you know, and I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it, but everybody dies. It's a samurai movie. Um, <laughs> and I didn't have any problem with that. I thought it was, it was done well. It was like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. You knew these people were doomed going in. Yeah. Uh, it had some really funny bits in it. They actually had a real martial artist doing the martial artist stuff. Um, and, and, you know, you can always, you can always gripe and compel. I mean, there's, there's always, no one's ever, I hear I, what I'm hearing right now is, is, you know, the Stephen King movie, the gunslinger is about to come out and people are jumping up and down and saying, it's going to be awful. It's going to suck. It's going to be terrible. I'm, I'm already reviewing it. It's so awful. Well, I don't know that. I don't know what they've done. And it's a, it's an entirely different medium. And so you have to dial things down and recognize it. I think Disney's done a pretty good job. Um, could it have been better? Sure. You know, I mean, but some of the movies that were pre-Disney were not all that great. Um, some of the characters that they created were, I won't even go down some of the roads about some of the stuff that they did. You know, it's, it's a wonderful toy and, and they wind it up and it plays. And sometimes it plays really well and sometimes not as well as others. I mean, I, I still think that the second movie uh, that was released, you know, is the best. The, the first one was terrific because of, it was new and no one had ever seen anything like it before. And the story was okay. But the sequel to that was really well done, really terrific. Right. And you're watching this and you're saying, you know, it's going to have to get dark because we know what happens. <laughs> we, yeah. we know how it ends up. We know that Darth Vader is this cute little kid who rides, you know, rides around in pod races and, and, you know, he's going to turn into Darth Vader. And, and how do you get from here to there without making it really dark? Mm -hmm. um, it, they killed off, I mean, again, not to be a spoiler if you haven't seen the movies, but, you know, um, when you killed off Han, I saw that was coming a long way off. I mean, you know, it, it, it seemed the perfectly obvious thing to do. Mm -hmm. I wasn't upset with it. Yeah, um, yeah well, Han was wanting to die, or, well, Harrison Ford was wanting yeah. to die to die in Return of the Jedi. Yeah, so he yeah. was ready to go. Yeah, well, I can understand that. That's because he had to get away from Carrie Fisher before he got found out. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. Oh, um, man. What, uh, so, so Kent brought up a, an interesting uh, subject. Last time, last time you were on, Steve, we, we talked a lot about you and your book, your writing, your writing style, and what got you into writing, stuff like that. This time, I want to know what your first Star Wars memory was, or is, rather, I guess. Oh, sure. Well, the first time I started writing just before the first, I started writing, trying to sell it professionally just before the first Star Wars movie came out. And I came up with a, a story about uh, a martial art that was when you learned it, you were undefeatable. You literally could not be beaten. And the catch was it made, it turned you into a cosmic do-gooder. You had to go out and do the right things. You couldn't let evil if you saw it pass unmolested you had to step up and become essentially you know a cosmic do-gooder and so i wrote this story and i sent it off to asimov's magazine and they bought it and i was i was really pleased with myself i come with this martial art and i use something called the wave which sounds a lot like the force 
Um, and it was this thing that the, the artists would tap into and they would be able to do these things. And so I was feeling pretty good about that. And then I saw this, there was this science fiction picture coming out. And of course, I went to see them just generally on, on principle. Uh, I went on a Tuesday because uh, Tuesdays was my day off from work. And this movie was showing at a local theater. And I two up to the window and there was nobody there. And I went in to see it. And there was like four of us in the theater. And we, I watched this movie, and by the end of it, I was jumping up and down. And, and of course, when, when Han Solo flies back in and blows Darth Vader spinning off in space, I yelled, sequel! Because I didn't know there was going to be another movie, but they had to be. They, did, they didn't kill Vader off. And I was bouncing up and down. Well, the, the local reviewer in the newspaper, where I was living at the time, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, just panned it. It was the worst movie he had ever seen. He'd never seen anything so awful. He couldn't stand it. It was just you know, half a star, if you, you know, it was just terrible. And so six months go by. And I, of course, I go back to see it again. And he goes back to see it again, too. And at this point, the theater is packed. It's you, you have to buy tickets in advance because you can't get in. People are seeing this and it's just going. The crowds are standing up and cheering in this thing. And the reviewer comes back and gives it pretty much the same review. It's awful. It's terrible. Nobody should like this movie. You shouldn't go see it. And I'm thinking to myself, there's an interesting job where you say things that have no connection to reality as the rest of us know it, and you get paid to do that. So, <laughs> yeah, I was quite thrilled. But at the same time, I was thinking to myself, they stole my idea. I mean, I came up with this. It's not like Lucas came up with the idea of Chi or Ki or the Force. I mean, this is, this is, you know, Kurosawa. This is, this is you know, all of this stuff is in, in, in it just he put it together in a way that no one had put it together before mm. uh, in a science fictional uh, uh, sequence that science fantasy, not really science fiction. Um, and so, yeah, my memory of it early on was like, this is just so cool. This is going to do really well. I can't wait for them to do the sequel. And of course. Yeah. Kent, what about yeah. you, man? Yeah. So I was, I was just a baby. And uh, so I, <laughs> I never saw the original one in the theater. Uh, well, not until the, the re-releases. Uh, but one of my earliest memories was going to the theater to see The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, I was already familiar with, with Star Wars by that time just because it was a pop culture. I mean, it was everywhere. I already had some action figures. I had a lunchbox. I had T-shirts. Yeah. I had, like, it was just, it was absolutely everywhere. Uh, so I begged my parents to take me to see The Empire Strikes Back. And my mind was blown it was everything that i was hoping it would be but more like it was it was my dreams come to life on the screen basically and i remember because i was only like like four years old i think when i saw it and um i remember when darth vader told luke i am your father I, all i could think of was he's a liar we know he's a bad guy and bad guys lie He's a liar. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it, it pretty much like it, it changed the way I looked at the world around me. Like it's I have loved Star Wars basically my entire life. And I think it's really shaped the way that I, uh, you know, take in any sort of uh, entertainment media at all, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, anything like that. It, uh, yeah, I, have, I absolutely love it, it from from the start. Amos, what what about you? How did you first experience Star Wars? So, so my initial, uh, uh, my my first time watching Star Wars or being being introduced to Star Wars is not quite as glamorous as either one of y'all stories. Uh, my first memory, period, dot, end of story. My very first memory is the Battle of Hoth. Um, That's my first okay. memory. Period. Like, there's nothing before that. There's no. I was so excited to see it. That's literally Starts where my where the... my life starts. <laughs> and I fell asleep after the Battle of Hoth, and I didn't see the rest of it until we. Uh, I remember sitting down. Um, I think it was with, with my with my grandpa, or maybe my uncle Bob, and watching like two of the movies, and I don't even remember which ones it was, which was which ones it was until like years later. Um, yeah, so that, that's my first memory of Star Wars. And then my stepdad, 
uh, he and I would sit there and record the, the shows off HBO on the VCR. And we uh, had yeah. one tape that is just, it is episode four, five, six, except it's episode five, six, four. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you had to for, fast forward for the, through the first two to watch the last one, then rewind the tape, and then watch the other two. And I remember that specifically because that's what I did. Like, once I discovered Star Wars and actually it was like prescient in my mind and I knew how to get it, it was Goonies, Star Wars, and the never ending story just in constant repeat all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So. Awesome. That's, yeah, that's not much different than, than me. I, yeah. It was it was it was fun. I think the the thing that nobody expected to do what it did. Certainly, Lucas didn't expect it to be that that big a hit. It was um, it was a kind of pulp fiction, science fiction thing that I grew up reading, and you know, put up on the screen. It was like everybody was having fun. The the reason that the second three movies, you number it's four, five, and six, and you know, six, seven. The, the numbering is, but the second three movies that came out were not fun in the same way. They, things had changed. People started to take this stuff really seriously, and the people at Lucasfilm started thinking, my God, this has to be great. We, we really have to be careful here. I mean, we have a following. It means something now. When they made the first movie, it didn't mean anything except Lucas had another job, uh, and he got to make this movie. And, and let me tell you that if you believe that he had nine movies in mind when he sat down and wrote that, you you must be smoking the drinks because this was all they had no clue what was going to happen. If you want to see something interesting, go back and pick up the the uh, Marvel comics from that period and look up look for a character named Jackson, J A X X O N, who was basically a puka, a giant green rabbit. Um, there was no continuity. There was nobody watching this stuff. Nobody had any idea that it was going to explode out. One of my favorite stories is that I, I early on in, uh, when I signed on to do this thing, I I sent him a note, and I said, so is there like a map of the galaxy so I know which planets I can use and which ones I can't use? And they went, ha, 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 ha. no map of the galaxy. Nobody's paying attention to this stuff. We have no idea where these planets are. Most of the writers who come on board just make up a new one and throw it in there someplace, which is what I was going to do. <laughs> and then I found a guy uh, via AOL, of all places, back in those days, who had gone through each movie and every book and every comic and had – had marked down every planet where it was in relation to the other planets as far as he could tell and the inhabitants and all the stuff. And he had built this huge big database, which he said, I'll send this to you if you want. I said, oh, God, yes. So he sent it to me. And I read it and I said, you send this to Lucasfilm. They will give you a job. And he sent it to Lucasfilm and they gave him a job. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. He, he, he actually, there, there were several people that have turned their hobby. Steve Sansweet was another one. He was their guy for a long time who wrote a lot of these encyclopedic things and, and had the collection of these wonderful toys and stuff. And he and I talked a couple of times about collectibles. He basically was a guy working, making good money working as a white collar. He started collecting this stuff, and all of a sudden he looks up and he has more than anybody else and knows more about it than anybody else. And Lucasfilm said, come to work for us. They, they were smart. They were able to pick out people who knew this stuff and pull them in. I don't. I don't know if, if if Disney's still doing it, but I expect that they are. Disney's not stupid. You know, whatever you think of the mouse and the way he runs things, they they they're not. They wouldn't have paid this many billion dollars for this if they didn't have a, a, a plan. Uh, yeah, and I I think they're handling it really really well. I think they've got the right people in place. Uh, Kathleen Kennedy, I think, is giving it the like appropriate amount of respect and care. Uh, they have a, uh, uh, a a story or uh, what do they call them? The Keepers of the Holocron is what they yes. call it. And it's, I have uh, a couple of the Holocrons. Yeah. They sent, they sent you a CD with all of the information on the Holocron. And they're all numbered and they're all, you know, I mean, you don't let it out. It's, you know, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't go anywhere. And that's the other thing is, is they were pretty big about secrecy. Mm -hmm. uh, so I never let anything out in advance. It was all part of the deal. I never had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. But the deal was if you talked when you weren't supposed to you weren't gonna be getting work there anymore i, I figured that out pretty quick and it's just not something i would do it's like it's if, if you release it publicly then i'll talk about it if it's not public my mouth is closed yeah uh, yeah all that stuff is out there they 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 really have laid all this stuff out well now i have a question to take on something we spoke about earlier uh sure we have the the dark tower series or an attempt at the dark tower series coming out yeah. Now, yeah. I'm 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 a big Stephen King fan. Like everything that I've read from Stephen King is amazing. 
I haven't read yeah. all of it, but everything that I've read, and I've read the stand, the complete and unabridged version. I think I've got some Stephen King cred, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, and, just that feat alone. Yeah, and I read it in like in like seven days in my fr- my jun- junior year. So I'm not. I'm, I'm just saying, like, if, if you can if you can knock out the stand, the, the complete and un- okay. unabridged version. I'll buy. Um, I haven't read Dark Tower. I haven't read any of it. I I knew it was out there, but it's just it was like it was this 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 daunting task that I didn't want to get into, didn't want to dive into, and I didn't yeah. know why I would need to until recently. Um, I think Schwood said on uh, Cord Killers, Brian Brushwood said on Cord Killers that um, the 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 TV series is coming out as like one more rotation of the tower as it goes through this like multiverse or whatever, and I was like, oh, now that sounds interesting. However, what if what if Disney bought the rights to the Dark Tower and all the tertiary products from it and wanted to expand on that the way they do Star Wars. Oh my gosh. See, I... I yeah. Can you, Dark Tower is, is like Lord of the Rings. You really can't do a movie of Lord of the Rings and do the, the book justice. Even three movies was cutting out 90% of what was there. This mm-hmm. is The difference between the media is that a book... You take a 450-page novel, which is a, a pretty good length, but not you know hugely long, and you turn it into a, a 105 or six or 50-page movie. This you've got a shell. That's just the nature of, of that of switching. Yeah, you can show a lot, but you know George when George wrote the the, the first the first book, you know he, he came through town on a, on a. Um, on the book signing thing, and I was working for the local newspaper, so I went to interview him, and I, I got a copy of the book, which is now worth eight hundred bucks, <laughs> and because um, he signed it and everything. Um, and so George R. R. Martin, for those of those who don't know what we're talking about here, uh, when he wrote the you know the, the, the first of that Fire and Earth series, uh, he thought he was going to do three books, maybe four, uh, and. The only way to treat something like that is to do it in an open-ended series, and it needs to be somebody like Showtime or Netflix or somebody who can give it the link that it needs. Now, the Gunslinger is there's no way you can you can narrow down what's out there to one movie. It's just it's just not possible. You you can't serve it. But what they said all along was this is not a, a, an adaptation of of the of the book. This is something different. Mm-hmm. It's the characters. It's the general idea story. It's going to be this long. It's going to do this much. And so that's what you have to look at it like. You, you, you don't look at it like, okay, Lord of the Rings. Oh, my God, how are you going to do Lord of the Rings in movies? Well, you do three movies, and they're not bad, but still it's just a drop in the bucket. If you're going to do something that has this kind of breath, and I did read The Gunslingers. I liked them. I think they were fun. They were actually, you know, he was just cutting loose because he didn't give a rat's ass. He could do anything he wanted. And so he just wrote for the hell of it and for the fun of it. And and if he wasn't having fun, he wasn't going to do it. And he was having fun, so he did it. Um, and I liked him. I think he did like anything else. I'm a big Stephen King fan. He, he has a touch. He has an ability to put words down in ways that, that pull you from one place to another. And you sort of don't even realize you're going there sometimes. Um, so whatever the movie is, however it comes out, I'm not going to connect it to the, to the books except for the name. It's the same thing. And I, and, and I know how this works, because I'm on the other side of this. I tried to watch Masters of Kung Fu uh, on Netflix, which is based on a series of comic books I read when I was a kid. Oh, it sucks. It sucks big time. There's nothing about this thing that I like. The martial arts were crappy. The actor who's playing the main role is the wrong guy. The plot, the action, the writing. There's nothing about this that's any good whatsoever. And you could just take it and dump it in the ocean. I managed to get through two episodes, and I went, I'm done. And I have all my people saying, but, you know, people who aren't martial arts don't know this stuff. Well, they're stupid. They need to learn enough because this is dumb. I mean, if you want to watch Wire Fu where there's really good martial arts and they're really having a good time, go watch Into the Badlands. It's bloody. It's gory. It's terrible. It's bad. But, boy, the, 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 the martial arts is really a hoot. These guys are cutting each other up and flying. This is, this is what a martial arts movie used to be when I was a kid. We watched all these old kung fu flicks that were all in Japanese or Chinese and, and with subtitles. And there was nothing realistic about any of them, but they were fun. Hmm. That was the difference. Iron Fist, no fun. No fun. So, Misery. I mean, Daredevil was fun. You know, Luke Cage was fun. Even Jessica was, you know, they, they had some. 
No, <laughs> so, no place for Iron Fist. Okay, okay. No place so, for Iron Fist. Bad, so, bad juju. So comments bring bring uh, comments. Um, first one. Stephen King, I'll admit, is an amazing writer. He he can put in words things to make your brain go into a certain place that, like, it, it makes you introspective as you're reading the book through the different perspectives. I just wish he could fucking finish. <laughs> like, like he well, like eighty percent of the way through a book, you can tell he's bored. Every book I've yeah. read, eighty percent of the way through, he's bored. Like he's told the story he wants. He doesn't want to. He wants to let you just imagine how it's supposed to go, yeah. but instead yeah. he has to put a finishing on it. He has to put a cap on it, and it's just like yeah. man, like it, it. That's the thing that kills me about Stephen King. It, it, it's 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 amazing. Eighty percent of the way through, and then all of a sudden there's a there's a chapter you're reading. Oh, he's yeah. lost interest in the story, or his deadline is next week, or. Yeah. Got to be wrapped up because he could write it for another another four hundred pages and, and be having to find. When when he yeah. did the stand, I read the stand when it first came out, and I thought this is a really good book. What it what it needs to do is it needs to be cut about three hundred pages, you know, down from eight hundred to five hundred or whatever. And it would be really tight. So I heard King is going to revise it. Oh, great! This will be terrific. Except that what he did was he added another three hundred pages, and then it was twelve hundred pages long. It's like Steve. But part part of the problem is 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 that because he's Stephen King, if he if he writes his laundry list down, it makes the New York Times bestseller list, and so the editors are a little loath to go in there and, and screw with it. Yeah. Um, uh, I would be too if I were his editor because it's like I'm Stephen King. This book's going to sell three million copies. Who are you? Right. Um, not that I think he would do that. I I met the guy a couple of times. And I, I have a funny story. If, if, if we have time later, I can tell you maybe after. Um, about my meeting, first meeting with Stephen King. But I think what happens is, is you get to a certain level and people just don't want to screw with who you are because mm-hmm. why kill the goose that laid the golden egg? Right, right. Yeah, that's an um, that's a interesting way to put that. The, the other question I have for you, uh, well, the, I guess the question because the other one was a comment. Have you seen Kung Fury? Kung Fury? Kung no, Fury. No, I I saw Kung Kung Pao. No, let's see Kung. No, you would know if you've seen Kung Fury. It's on oh, Netflix. I seen it. Oh my gosh! Uh-huh. It it is it takes it takes Kung Fu, adds ridiculous, and smashes them together as hard as it can in a, in a forty minute show, and it is a hoot. Oh my uh-huh. gosh! It's a hoot. It's a it's a eighties flashback. It was a Kickstarter movie, and yeah. it's amazing. It takes all the tropes of, of bad '80s action movies mm-hmm. and a few tropes from from video game, like eight bit video games, and just <laughs> yeah, just kind of mashes it all into a ball with the martial arts and just throws. Well, I'll, I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, it's, 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 I thought Kung Fu Hustle was pretty funny, and uh, there's been a couple of the of the of the uh, Run Run Shaw brother movies that I go back and look at once in a while and just crack up laughing. But uh, I I. I there's some pretty interesting martial arts movies out there, and there's a there's a, a, a Thai martial artist that that has done some movies. Um, um, Om Bak is the name of the, the picture, and it's just amazing to watch this kid. He leaps off tall buildings, he bounces, jumps, he does all his own stunts. He you know, sets himself on fire and does flying kicks. I mean, there's stuff in there and you go, holy crap! How could he do that and not kill himself? I mean, he looks like a cross between a martial artist and a you know, a free runner, you know, and, and he just, he does some amazing things. It's like he's got to be dead by the time he's 30 years old because he will beat himself to a pulp. Yeah. I think I saw Ung Bak two. I think it was, I think it was number two. And yeah, this kid is like, it's like Jackie Chan on crack. Yeah. Yeah. Skip, skip three, three is no good, but the first couple are pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty good stuff. Um, Amos, what else did, um, what else do we have to cover? Is there is there anything left besides? Um... Uh, so just just one thing. Kent, uh, I don't know where you got this idea from. I don't know if it's one that you pulled out of a hat or whatever else. Adam Driver, my journey from marine to actor. Yeah, so basically what I did to choose this talk, uh, because nobody has sent us a suggestion, 
uh, podcast at ritualmisery.com or at Ritual Misery on Twitter for suggestions on what we should uh, look at for a TED uh, Talk. Saucy in the chat room saying she I, totally helped with this, so she's stealing your credit right now. I, so I, I basically what I did was I went to TED.com and typed Star Wars in the search bar, and this was the first thing that came up. It was actually the only thing that really had anything at all to do with Star Wars, and it mm. really didn't. It just has Adam Driver in it, and he was Kylo Ren. <laughs> so that's really the only Star Wars connection. Uh, but that is why I chose it. Uh, Adam Driver, he used to be a Marine, and then he became an actor after he got hurt and got medically discharged. He dislocated from... his sternum. His sternum. Can you imagine? <laughs> he he was uh, dirt biking, I think. Yeah. And... Uh, Doing yeah, some he probably landed really hard and, and uh, fell forward into the handlebars, is what I imagine. Uh, but can you imagine the pain of that? <laughs> I've dislocated a rib. That was bad enough. I wouldn't want to dislocate my sternum. That's not... Like, that's like... How did your heart not stop? <laughs> I, I wonder if that's what he's thinking of when he's doing those those pain scenes in uh, TFA. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, but um, anyway, so this this guy, he had a really interesting story, and I, being a military veteran myself, I kind of, I understood what he was saying uh, about the the camaraderie and the, you know, basically the, your unit becomes your family, and it seems like when you get out of the military, the transition is, is a little bit difficult because, um, you know, especially coming home from a deployment where, you know, you're trying to stay alive and everything that that you do is all about survival and, and making sure that your unit survives and fulfilling the mission, all that stuff. And then you come home and we're worried about, um, you know, where's the damn TV remote or, uh, who took the trash out? Yeah. Who, you know, and like things that just really don't freaking matter, but you have to kind of like, you know, just readapt yeah. into that, like slower pace, less, less life or death type of a, type of thing and then he talked about how he like took the i guess the mindset of of being a marine and applied that to being an actor which was uh kind of his passion before he went into the military i guess amos what did you what did you get from this what 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 do you think was like the uh the main thing he was trying to communicate um it, it was that disconnect that uh, uh, the acting world, the, the world of theater and of art is so worse, so, so different than the, the world of mil the military. And um, he wanted to find a way to bridge the two, to bring some of the creative arts in front of military people in a way that wasn't, uh, it, it wasn't against the military way of, of life but it wasn't necessarily trying to pull the military into the art world and uh, trying to find a, a way to merge those two. And what he would basically, essentially what he did is created a, or helped create, I, I don't remember, I don't think he created, I think he found it and helped develop it or whatever. Um, a way to, it's a small theater group setting that goes around to different military locations and they've done like Walter Reed and, and, you know, things like that, the medical centers and all this stuff. And these little bases and, and gone overseas and, and things and kind of brought just the art to the military and brought it in a way that the people can relate to without having to relate to the art. Yeah, one thing that I thought was really cool about how they do this is it's not like a traveling play. They don't bring a play, this whole, you know, high production value. Right, no. They don't build a set. There's no costumes. They just have they, these they, very talented. Actors basically yep. just reading; they're basically doing a table read in front of an audience. Um, well, it, it's not just that either. Very the, 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 he said they will do a play, but it won't be a production play. It won't be costumes and lighting and sets, and it's just right. hey, here's here's some professional uh, artists performing in the most comfortable setting possible, without the theater yeah. of it. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. It doesn't even have to be in like in an auditorium. It mm -hmm. could be in uh, an aircraft hangar. It could be in uh, you know a mechanical shop or well, something. I mean, the it the, the, the way to develop a versatile set is to not have a set. Yeah. So exactly. Um, and but, uh, I th 
I thought it was very cool. This is one of the longer TED Talks that's out it's there. It's 1801, and, I think. Um, yeah, and I really enjoyed it. I, I actually thought the second half of it, which is where they have the the dramatic reading. Yeah, they give it, an example of yeah. what the truth does. And the story told, if, you, if you're if you in for a... The, the whole talk is 18 minutes and one second long, which is right at the maximum time for a TED Talk. Yeah. The first eight minutes of it is Adam Driver explaining this progress or the, this process in this um, in his history and things like that, and it's actually pretty good. I didn't particularly care for him in TFA and in, in The Force Awakens, um, but I was in I don't want to say enraptured, but I was enthralled by his presentation on the stage when he's talking about the thing that he's doing, and um, when it transitioned over, I didn't know what to make of it. But the performance piece, which is the last nine minutes of this TED talk is outstanding it's got a little twist in it it's got um some genuine emotion it's it's amazing it's it's awesome and yep. it's something i would definitely go see if i had something like that in my area or if i was aware that i had something like that in my area yeah that's the i think that's the so catch um steve does any of this sound interesting to you <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's fascinating i'm always interested in the creative process no matter which way it goes yeah, I'm, I'll check this one out. Um, so once again, that was uh, Adam Driver, My Journey from Marine to Actor. Um, now, Kent, it's it's Star Wars time. It's May the 4th, man. It's the, today's International Star Wars Screw Everything Else Day. Right. Yeah, and we were super lucky to get a Star Wars, bonafide Star Wars author on our show. That's really cool. Um, you know what's even cooler than that? We found a manuscript or a, basically a, an outline, a an brief outline. outline of something that Steve had written a long time ago that he threw in the trash that somebody actually dug up out of a dumpster. <laughs> I'm sure you did. <laughs> See, and, 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 and I, I gave you an opportunity to talk about this earlier, but I, I don't know why you didn't bring it up. Um, I, uh, but, but we found it anyway. So, I mean, it, it, we, we have some awesome people out there that are always rummaging through things. And, and you know, we, we, they, they dig through the archives for, to find this stuff. So Now, sometimes, uh, sometimes they dig through the garbage, they find actual garbage. And sometimes they find something that just makes us all laugh a whole lot. So, uh-huh. Yeah, so th- this particular thing is, um, Amos, is it, do you want me to set it up and you read it? Uh, sure, sure, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so... So basically, this is a um, this is a demonstration of of imperial power. Is basically what this is. It's uh, kind of uh, a piece of propaganda that was put out there to the citizens of the empire, basically saying, "Here's why you should not resist us." And this is this is like we said, this is something that we found in Steve's trash. Uh, Amos, go ahead and uh, go ahead and read this for us. <clears throat> It is useless to resist the awful power of the Empire. We have an arsenal of weapons that cause our enemies to shake in their pages. Our greatest invention is the Death Ukulele, a space station that can destroy an entire cosmic do-gooder with a creative blast. (laughs) The Imperial Star Destroyers are much smaller and faster than a death crack, but are still fully functional bases for storm hobbies. My favorite weapons are the Imperial Walkers, tanks that look like local metal beasts that can transport movies across a battlefield, all while a pilot at the front blasts the enemy collectibles with lasers. <laughs> now that you are aware of the all, uh, now that you are, are aware of all the power in the Empire's sequel, you'll think twice about trying to cheer against it. <laughs> No, uh, after reading I, I that, I can, I can kind of see. Away. I can kind of see why <laughs> that didn't make the final cut there, Steve. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's dross. You just, you know, you just have to go. With, you know, Sturgeon's Law is that ninety percent of science fiction is crud, but then ninety percent of everything is crud. <laughs> right, right. Oh man, I, I can, I can definitely see the artistic vision which you were going for in that, though. But uh, yeah, just, <laughs> yeah. just, just a little, <laughs> little left to Tatooine on that one, you know. Yeah, well, 
A little bit. There was there was a Shakespearean undertone there that I was trying for. It was it was hard to achieve. Yeah, a little 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 uh, little Hamlet touch there. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. Troy is Cressida. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, what what do you have going on these days? What do you what do you have on the horizon? You got any? Are, are you working on any novels or um, uh, screenplays or pop what, records? What do you got, what do you got coming yeah, up? Yeah, actually, I'm working. On, I've got several things going. Some of which I can talk about generally, and some of which I can be more specific. Um, I'm doing a, uh, a novel with uh, the science fiction uh, writer and um, Dan, Daniel Keith Moran, who if you haven't read any of this stuff, you should go dig it up. He's, he's a computer guy, and he makes a lot of money doing that, so he doesn't write as much as he should. But uh, we're working on a kind of a Time Lords novel um, called Cosmic Blues, and it's a um, time and space. And the basic premise is it starts out as a, a, a rock group from the 19 or from the, the year the 2000 current current day gets transported back to the year 1948 and they don't know why or how uh, and so you have they're having to deal with the reality of 1948 versus 2017 and the one of the problems is is there there there's a white guy there's a black guy there's a, there's a Hispanic woman uh, and a black woman and they're all bisexual so it, it makes it kind of interesting to see what they're going to do when they get back there. Um, this Dan like is my really browsing history. He's one of the best space opera writers that I've ever read. If you have a chance to pick up any of these books, Daniel Keith Moran, check them out. Um, we're kind of doing this in our spare time. It's, it's a back burner book. I've been working on a novel, a, a script, a screenplay for a comic book whose name I can't mention for a company whose name I can't mention. Uh, but uh, if it in fact comes to pass and ever makes it to the screen, it'll be great fun, and I'll make a lot of money. Um, uh, that, that's anytime you work for Hollywood is always iffy, but in, in, it's all shrouded in secrecy. The other the other project that I've got I got two other things. I'm working on a couple of short stories I have coming out in anthologies. I, I don't don't write a lot of short fiction, but it's kind of fun to do because you can do them quickly. Uh, one of my favorite novels, in fact, my favorite science fiction novel of all time is called Lord of Light by a uh, writer named Roger Zelazny. Uh, what came out in the mid-60s, and, and it just hit me at the right time to become uh, a you know, personal favorite. It's not the best book ever written, but it's, it, it really spoke to me. And his son, he passed away, his son and a, a, an editor, a, a friend of ours, who decided they were going to do a, an homage, and so they put together an anthology of short pieces using his worlds, his characters. Um, and I was, I got invited to, to, to put a story in that. So that's coming out next month uh, it's called Shadows and Reflections. And uh, it, I had a fun, it, it's a short, short story, and I had, it was such a hoot to write because I got to take some characters that I love growing up and put them through the paces. That's one of the reasons you write in someone else's universe. I mean, you get to take them places, do things with them that you always wanted to do. I mean, I, I've written for Batman, the animated series, so I can tell you where Batman learned to fight. You know, I, I got, I've written for Conan the Barbarian, so I can tell you where his muscles came from. You know, and, and uh, I've written for Star Wars, so I've got all kinds of stories about where those things came from. And this was kind of a fun thing to do. And other than that, I have two other books that are sort of vaguely in the distance that I need to get back to which are in the universe that I wrote uh, called The Matadors. And it's about few sort of futuristic bodyguards and martial artists fighting against the galaxy, which is evil. And uh, I, I wanted to write a sequel to the books that I had written and uh, kind of go back and pick up 20 years later what happened to the people who were there and what happened to their kids. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I have plenty on the table. Given that I'm supposed to be retired, I'm... <laughs> <laughs> that's very cool very that's cool awesome. is there any place that people could go on the internet to keep up with with all of your your things no not really uh i mean i i have a presence on twitter but i don't go there um i, I i'm on facebook so you know if you, if you look for me on facebook you can probably find me and i post some stuff up there once in a while most of the time i i should be working instead of wasting time on facebook and twitter <laughs> I'm not so social media, the so, bane of society. So, oh, so yeah, what, you, what you need sucks. to do, Steve, is you, you need to link up your Twitter account with your uh, Facebook. Same time you post to one, it automatically posts to the other. 
Yeah. Yeah, there's a, there's a meme on Facebook today I like. I thought you would get a kick out of today's, you know, May the 4th be with you. Tomorrow is, um, and I, and then let me make sure I get get the phrasing right. The, tomorrow is the 5th, right? Yes. Uh, so would, it be, would that be the 5th strikes back? Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, see, I I heard it as uh, yeah, or Revenge of the Fifth, yeah, uh-huh. Revenge of the Fifth. Yeah. That, that's, so, both of those yeah, are that's, awful. That's what I'm up to. I uh, um, I I got a joke on. for you, real quick. Uh, saw this on, on the old Facebook earlier today. Uh, <clears throat> Mike Tyson has no idea why May the Fourth is funny. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> that's funny! <laughs> wow, <laughs> but you have to know Mike Tyson if you haven't heard him speak. It's not going to make a lot of sense. Exactly, to there's, there's an extra layer there. It's it's yeah. <laughs> so, Amos, if people want to to follow your interesting sense of humor, where would they go for that? Uh, you can find me on on Twitter at Ethan Kane. Just go there. That's 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 all about it. Uh, that's that's about it. Uh, how about you, Kent? Yeah, I am at RM underscore Del Noche on Twitter. I'm always doing some weird stuff on there. Uh, check me out there, or I am Del Noche pretty much everywhere else to include Untapped for all of the fellow beer lovers out there. Um, real quick, two things we forgot to mention. One is this. Challenge accepted. <laughs> doing other things in these streets. No, that's crazy. This looks like a job for Amos's Ball. Oh, on the Ritual Misery Podcast. So as of right now, I have reached out to every suggestion we've received. I've gotten uh, uh, I've gotten one possibility that I'm not ready to, to talk about yet because it's not quite fleshed out. I'm not, I don't want to count my chickens. So next week okay. is Molly Wood, which I believe uh, is the second of the challenges. So yep. she's going to be on next week. And um, if you have another suggestion... I think from now on, we're only going to take suggestions via Twitter. Ah, okay, it's right. only right. via Twitter or Patreon post. If you're a patron, you can go in there and post it in there. But it, uh, if you have a suggestion, reach out to us at Ritual Misery on Twitter, and uh, that will be the official channel. Um, and I'll go from there. And uh, I've reached out to everyone on our list thus far, and I've received w- at least one response that, uh, that I can't speak of yet, and uh, I'm hoping for some more. And next week is Molly Wood, and here shortly, within the next month or so, we're probably gonna release that uh, release that uh, uh, Globa Gloria, yeah, yeah, uh, interview, which was just a complete hoot. Um, man, that was such. I, I went back and re-listened to it, and she is just an amazing. I, I can see where Justin gets all his talent from because she's pretty much an, oh, an amazing person. Yeah, she's awesome, isn't she? Um, oh my gosh, I love that woman. And with that said, uh, we do have some Diamond Club news. Brett, yes. the Amtrak so, Roundsville has started a podcast all yep. about. So he's got a, he's got an app that is really popular. I know a lot of our audience has his app, Mission Pick. Uh, aspiring photographers out there, he now has a podcast where he talks about photography and he gets guests on to talk about uh, you know their adventures, taking pictures and things like that. Uh, just came out. Yesterday, I think, was when he released his first episode. So I encourage everybody to check that out. We'll have a link to it in the show notes. Um, I think Amos is going to throw it in the chat here. Uh, but also, if you just search Mission Pick in iTunes or, or anywhere else, and um, I'm sure you'll find it. Um, and finally, uh, one last little bit of, uh, of news. Um, you all know I had a podcast called Undaunted, right, that went into Podfade? <laughs> right, yes, Podfade. Pod it's a thing. Um, expect that to come back around. All right. Uh, we have our music is brought to us by whom? I even said whom. I said it right. Kevin whom? McLeod, dude. Yeah. Like, you should, you should be on these Kevin things. Kevin McLeod. Kevin From McLeod brought us our music. Com? He's in awesome incomptech.com. You can find us uh, every Thursday night at 7 p.m. Central or 7 p.m. Pacific at diamondclub.tv. We will see you next week. <laughs> Time.
Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>